10 Tragic Cases of Children by Social Workers Child welfare agencies were created to promote the safety and well-being of children. They investigate cases of family violence, child abuse, and neglect, and when necessary, they take protective action. The goal of social workers is to keep children with their families when it is deemed safe and to provide them with a safe environment when they are determined to be at risk. Unfortunately, many cases are ignored or mishandled in such a way that the abused child continues to suffer. When social workers fail to act, the consequences can be deadly. Their negligence in these cases makes them almost as culpable as the perpetrators. 1. Mona Sock Martha Mulia worried about strange men on the street preying on her daughter Mona. She didn't worry about the man inside the foster home where 13-year-old Mona Sock lived. Mona had been staying at her sister Harmony's home on Elsie Pogtog First Nation, located about 90 kilometers north of Moncton, and B. For several years, child protection workers who were supervising Mona didn't do a background check on Harmony's husband, Lonnie Francis. Had they done a background check, they would have discovered Francis had a conviction for sexual assault. They might have looked for another home for Mona. Mona might have been saved from abuse by Francis, but they didn't. On the afternoon of September 26, 2007, a month shy of her 14th birthday, Mona disappeared. She would become one of at least 53 children known to child protection workers to die from unnatural causes in New Brunswick since 1997. Her death was reviewed by the province's Child Death Review Committee, and sparked a deeper dive into the state of First Nations child welfare in the province. Milia was at work at the community gas station, when a social worker came looking for Mona. The social worker wanted to ask the girl if Francis was abusing her, even though the social worker already knew the answer. She told me that Lonnie Francis was molesting Mona. All this time, Milia says, the sexual abuse had just been reported to police that day. The social worker told Milia to call an officer if she spotted her daughter. At about 8 p.m., when the gas bar was quiet, Milia went outside and called Mona's name. She thought she might be hiding. You can come and live with me, babe, her mother yelled. Just come out. There was no response. Milia went straight home when her shift ended at 11 p.m. She figured social workers might ask her to pick up Mona once they found her. Milia's boyfriend continued to search outside on the reserve by the Richabucta River, while Milia made coffee and waited by the phone. Finally, it rang. It was Mona's sister, Harmony. They found her, she said. All this time, Mona had been behind the arena. Milia asked if she should pick her daughter up. She heard crying on the other end of the line. Mona was gone. Harmony said she'd taken her own life. Pictures of Mona's face. The walls of her older sister Renee Milia's small home. There are school pictures and awards, glowing by candlelight. Renee's son was born after Mona died, but he blows kisses to the pictures every night before bed. Renee and her mother spread more photos on the table, crying as they flip through them. Mona proudly holding her nieces, whom she loved to babysit. Mona at school, where she was an eighth grader. She wanted to be something. They say, the women play a memorial slideshow set to the tune of Martina McBride's Concrete Angel. It's hard to see the pain, behind the mask, bearing the burden, of a secret storm. Mona's mother and sister say she never showed any warning signs of mental illness. I didn't expect that it would happen like this, Renee says. Renee was in the delivery room when her little sister Mona was born at quarter to five in the morning of October 25, 1993. Renee, who was already an adult, was instantly in love with her new sister. When Mona was a baby, she and her mother floated between Renee's home and Mona's father's home, breaking Renee's heart every time they left. The back and forth went on for years before Renee finally put her foot down. I said, never again I'm going to take care of my mom's kids. That was the worst thing I said. She wishes Mona came to live with her instead. In 2009, two years after Mona's death, Francis was convicted of two counts of sexually assaulting her. Court records show he'd also been convicted in 1999, years before Mona moved in of sexual assault against a different person. According to parole board records, Francis engaged in sexual activity with Mona on at least two occasions over a two-week period. He was sentenced to two and a half years in prison. You told the board that your relationships with your wife had become very distant. You were unemployed, and sought comfort from your victim at the time of your offense. The board decision says, you know that your actions were wrong but nevertheless rationalized and justified them at that time. According to the board, Mona had indicated to some people that if the abuse were revealed, she wouldn't want to live. Mona Sok as a baby. Mona Sok was born at a quarter to five in the morning on October 25, 1993. She hanged herself from a tree behind the recreation center the day Francis was reported to police. After the 13-year-old suicide, the Child Death Review Committee publicly recommended better guidelines for background checks for foster parents. It didn't tell the public that Mona had been allowed to live in a foster home with a convicted sex offender. Bernard Richard, the former New Brunswick child and youth advocate, says the rules were clear in the case of Mona Sock, and there should have been a criminal background check. Behind Elsie Pogtog's graffiti-marked arena, beyond the snow-covered baseball diamond, 
A piece of yellow police tape still flickers in the wind. It's been almost 10 years since police marked off the spot in the woods where Mona took her own life. Nearly a decade since Mona's family and friends placed a single white cross, draped in a scarf, to mark where she took her last breath. The memorial has survived a decade's worth of winter storms and new seasons. On the first anniversary of her death, family and friends gathered there to remember her. They released balloons that were all red, her favorite color. Mona is buried a few blocks away in a parish cemetery. The heart-shaped gravestone is framed by an angel. Her stone is engraved with her last school picture. 2. Sarah Brass Sarah Brass's life was defined by layers of neglect. There was the neglect she suffered from her family until she died at the age of 8. And there was the neglect of child protective services, which could have saved her so many different times. The details of Sarah's short life, as told Sunday by the Express News' Melissa Fletcher Stooge, are heartbreaking. At times, Sarah went hungry, wore urine-soaked underwear, lived in a house smeared with feces and showed up to school on freezing days without a coat. Sarah once told a counselor she was afraid of her father, David Brass. Child Protective Services knew all this, and more. Yet, all the agency could muster was a parade of inexperienced caseworkers to check on the welfare of Sarah and her two brothers. Sarah died of untreated acute appendicitis in February 2009, and CPS could have, and should have, stopped that, too. During the two days before Sarah's death, a school counselor, school nurse and a shirts police officer notified CPS about suspected neglect. Child Protective Services manager Diane Jones declined to investigate or even check on Sarah, Stooge reported. So often when the public talks about Child Protective Services, if we talk about child welfare at all, the conversation is distilled to overworked staffers at an underfunded agency. And this should be, certainly, part of the conversation. The Child Welfare League estimates that 12 to 15 cases a month are manageable for a worker, but CPS workers in Bixar County juggled on average 21 cases a month last fiscal year. Many of the CPS workers involved with Sarah, and her siblings handled significantly more cases than that. One, had more than 50 cases. For such high-pressure work, Salaries at CPS are incredibly low. Entry-level CPS investigators earn only $36,000 a year. Addressing caseloads and increasing salaries would go a long way toward improving morale and reducing staff turnover, which was 38.5% in 2012 in Bixar County for investigator caseworkers. But to simply limit the conversation around CPS to funding and staffing would also be a disservice to our children and a pathway to more deaths. We must not avoid scrutinizing failures and should have no tolerance for them. Young lives are in jeopardy. CPS culture is a culprit. The articles described internal politics, cronyism and favoritism. Success within the agency is based on compliance and personal relationships rather than performance. One investigator said, preferred CPS workers handle monthly caseloads in the single digits, while others are forced to take on the remaining burden. Promotions are based on completing a set of courses, yet, many supervisors never complete required training. This is particularly noteworthy since a CPS investigator found neglect in Sarah's home, only to have the finding overturned by managers. Most troubling, CPS appears accountable to no one outside the agency. It shields itself in silence. After Sarah's death, the agency grudgingly performed an in-house review that suggested more staff training. No one has been held accountable at the agency for mishandling Sarah's case. Clearly, the issues with the agency require more than this. We suggest an independent audit of CPS by the state attorney general's office to examine concerns around favoritism, disciplinary actions and a lack of training for supervisors in Bixar County. While it did not pass, we also support state Sen. Carlos Oresti's bill last session that would have created an external task force composed of CEOs and labor specialists to reduce turnover at CPS. And after a child dies, CPS case records should be made public, with appropriate redactions to preserve sibling privacy. By opening these records, the public would gain a better understanding of CPS efforts to keep kids safe, and failures to be avoided in future cases. Child Protective Services is supposed to be the safety net for Texas kids. The agency handles thousands upon thousands of cases a year. It's too late to save 8-year-old Sarah Brass. But unless changes are made CPS will continue doing a better job of protecting itself than the children for which it is responsible. 3. Aaron Minor. Two state social workers were charged Monday in connection with the death of a three-year-old Detroit boy whose death allegedly came at the hands of his mother last May. Elena Brown, 24, and Kelly M. Williams, 47, both Wayne County residents, have been charged in the case of Aaron Minor. Aaron's decomposed body was found on the afternoon of May 25th in an apartment. He shared with his mother on Trumbull near Warren on Detroit's west side. The mother, Deanna Minor, allegedly had checked herself into a local mental institution, 
when the boy's body was found. She has been charged and faces a competency hearing in her son's death November 30th. The Wayne County Medical Examiner's Office determined that the child's death was a homicide. The boy's mother was arrested August 4th and charged with felony murder, second-degree murder, first and second degree child abuse and failure to report a dead body. The child was discovered in a bed at the apartment in the 4400 block of Trumbull. Brown and Williams have been charged with involuntary manslaughter and second degree child abuse, both felonies. Involuntary manslaughter is punishable by up to 15 years in prison, and a conviction on second degree child abuse could result in a maximum prison sentence of 10 years. Both women arraigned Monday and given $25,000 personal bond and ordered not to be around children as part of the jobs. They were scheduled for November 21st probable cause conference and November 28th preliminary examination. Brown and Williams have been suspended with pay as a result of the charges, said Bob Wheaton, a spokesman for Michigan's Department of Health and Human Services. Brown has been with the department since 2015, and Williams since 1995. Wheaton said he could not provide further comment on the allegations but that department officials have reviewed that particular case. Wheaton said like all Americans, the women are presumed innocent as they go through the court system, and that our department will let the court system proceed with the case. Wheaton said the department is saddened by the child's death, and added our employees are committed to protecting children from neglect and abuse. The prosecutor's office said Brown and Williams were grossly negligent and reckless in connection with their treatment of the case involving the boy and his mother. The women did cause the death of Aaron Minor due to their gross negligent failure to perform a legal duty to protect the well-being and safety of the boy. They ignored ongoing reports, according to the prosecutor, that Deanna Minor was becoming more incapable of caring for her son due to her mental illness, and that the child was becoming more at risk of being harmed. Brown and Williams also caused serious physical harm by knowingly or intentionally committing an act that likely would result in serious physical harm to the child, according to the prosecutor's office. The women also failed to develop a safety plan and monitor the well-being of the child. According to the prosecutor's office, we charged this case after much thought and deliberation, Wayne County Prosecutor Kim Worthy said in a statement. We did not make this decision lightly. We must seek to hold these defendants responsible for their alleged inaction. The ultimate result in this case was the death of a child that never should have happened. According to the statement released by Worthy's office, Brown received a referral from the Deanna Miner's mental health worker. On April 21st and 22nd, Brown allegedly visited the mother's residence and determined there was not enough food in the apartment. Brown allegedly never saw the boy's mother again after April 22nd, but did speak to her supervisor, Williams, about the case. Brown allegedly sent Miner a letter May 9th to contact Child Protective Services, which the mother failed to do, according to the prosecutor's office. The CPS policy and procedure requires that when a family cannot be located, fail to cooperate, and there are allegations of imminent risk, the CPS worker must contact the police for a safety check, and file a petition with the juvenile court. According to the statement from Worthy's office, Brown and Williams were grossly negligent and reckless in performing their duties, because they failed to provide a safety plan to protect the child, and also they failed to respond and follow through on reports by mental health workers, failed to ask police for a safety check of their mother's apartment and also to file a petition with juvenile court authorities, and also to follow CPS policy and procedures. The prosecutor's office said in its release Monday, more details are expected to be released about the investigation, including events which resulted in Aaron's death. During the preliminary examination for Brown and Williams, 4. Leliana Wright. Leliana was one of dozens of children who died in Texas in 2016, as a result of abuse or neglect, despite being on Child Protective Services radar. The child's mother and her mother's boyfriend are accused by police of beating and torturing the little girl at their home in March 2016. According to police, Jerry Quizada and Charles Pfeiffer were both high on heroin, and beat Leliana because she drank her little brother's juice. After her death, a citizen who is not connected to the case sent Fox 4, an audio recording of a Tarrant County associate judge speaking about legal proceedings, that came before the child's death. The recording reveals how even when CPS is involved in a case, a family court judge may not find out about it. To understand the context of the secret recording, one must go back to 2014, more than a year before Leliana's death. Leliana's paternal grandmother, Elisa Cluckley, filed a petition in court for custody and raised serious concerns about her granddaughter's safety. The custody case was filed in Tarrant County and a hearing was set to go before Associate Judge Diane Haddock in December 2015. However, both parties ended up agreeing to a settlement outside of the courtroom, and the case never went to a hearing. Cluckley told Fox 4, she agreed to give the mother custody of Leliana at the advice of her attorney because she did not understand the court system and was afraid to lose visitation rights. In Cluckley's sworn statements filed to the court before the scheduled hearing that never happened, 
publicly raised concerns about Liliana's safety, and alleged that the mother was using drugs, but after listening to the audio recording of the judge, made after Liliana's death, and investigating the Texas family court system, Fox 4 has learned that Judge Haddock was never required to read the information quickly filed. The citizen who made the recording and provided it to Fox 4 asked not to be identified, because she has a family member who also has a case before Judge Haddock. They had an opportunity, in my opinion, to protect Liliana and prevent this. The caller told Fox 4, it all started when the citizen saw a news story in April 2016 about Liliana's case. She called the judge's offers to voice her concerns and left a message. The caller was surprised to get a call back from the judge herself. The caller recorded the conversation without the judge's knowledge, which is legal in Texas. Fox 4 verified the authenticity of the recording by sending it to Judge Haddock herself, who did not dispute that it was her voice in the recording. Judge Haddock and Judge William Harris, who appointed Haddock, both declined to interview for this story, citing an ongoing investigation by the State Commission on Judicial Conduct sparked by the recording itself. Terrible tragedy. I've been on the bench 17 years. Hard to talk about this case. Judge Haddock is heard saying in the recording, I still lose my breath about it, and cry my eyes out. The recording is roughly 30 minutes long. The judge goes on to reveal conflicting information about the case. When, the grandmother, filed, she attached an affidavit, but there was no evidence in the affidavit. The judge said, Now, since we have done the research we've done, and CPS did their research, there was never even a CPS report prior to January 2016. What about in the affidavit? There are indications that CPS was involved with the mother, the caller asked. It wasn't true. It wasn't true, said Judge Haddock. But the caller was right. According to a state report obtained by Fox 4, CPS opened investigations involving Liliana and her mother in 2014, 2015 and 2016, but, Judge Haddock did not know of about the first CPS case at the time of the scheduled hearing in 2014, because there were no supporting documents included with Clickley's affidavit. The judge is also recorded discussing the mother's alleged drug use around her children. According to the affidavit, Lily and his little half-brother, is born with marijuana. No evidence of that. There is no evidence of that, Judge Haddock said, again. The grandmother's allegations of the mother's drug use were not supported by official documents filed to the court, but, Fox 4 was able to confirm what she had alleged in her affidavit. In October 2014, two months before the scheduled hearing, CPS had already received a report that Liliana's little half-brother was born with drugs in his system. During that CPS investigation, the children's mother tested positive on a drug test. Despite all of this evidence existing, Clickley's attorney did not file any supporting documents with the court to back up his client's sworn statement. The caller shared the recording with Elisa Clickley, Liliana's grandmother. After hearing the judge speak about her family's case to a third party and give misinformation, Clickley filed a complaint against Judge Haddock with the State Commission on Judicial Conduct. Family law attorney Lossie Bowman is not connected to the case. Fox 4 reached out to her to find out what other things could have helped the grandmother's case. Bowman explained how custody cases work in general. If there are things like an arrest report, CPS report, you can subpoena a CPS worker to bring the file, Bowman said. You can subpoena the documents from the police department. All of those things are tools the client has to get all of the evidence before the judge. Despite Elisa Clickley's affidavit raising her concerns, her attorney advised her to come to an agreement outside of Haddock's courtroom. He said, Elisa, if you go into her courtroom, those were his exact words, you are going to lose everything, Clickley said. These attorneys were afraid, if you will, to go into her courtroom. Both parties agreed to give Lily and his mother custody and guarantee the Clickley's visitation rights. As a result, Judge Haddock never heard the case, but signed off on the agreement. Clickley's attorney, Gregory Houseworth, declined to talk to Fox 4 about why he advised Clickley not to go before Judge Haddock. Clickley also filed a complaint with the State Bar of Texas against Houseworth. She believed as there had been a hearing in the case, Liliana would be alive today. The State Bar of Texas determined Clickley's attorney did not violate any rules handling her case. In April 2016, a month after Liliana's death, Judge William Harris, who appointed Judge Haddock spoke to Fox 4 about the case. It certainly appears that there should have been a hearing in this case. Judge Harris said, It certainly appears the court should have been given evidence about the mother, and her circumstances and I think it was tragic the court was never allowed to hear that evidence. Clickley said she feels the system failed Liliana. She hopes changes are made in the judicial system to require family court judges, to read affidavits like the one she filed before signing off on an agreement. She believes that way. The next time there are red flags about a child's safety, a judge can question them before it's too late. Pfeiffer and Quezada are both charged with felony injury to a child. Their trials are slated to begin in Dallas County in April. Fox 4 receives dozens of calls and emails every month from parents, 
and family members who are concerned that the court system is not keeping their children safe. After interviewing family law attorney Lacey Bowman for this story, Fox 4 has learned some things people can do to make sure their concerns are being heard by the court. First of all, often, it can be frustrating for a parent, grandparent, or relative when CPS will not release a child's case file to them. But, according to Bowman, a CPS case file can become public through a court hearing. An attorney can subpoena the CPS case worker and ask them to bring the case file. However, there does have to be a hearing to get that file entered into evidence. For example, in Clickley's case, a CPS case worker did show up for the hearing, but since the case was settled outside the courtroom, the case worker's testimony and evidence was never heard by the judge. 5. Jacob No. It was an unspeakable tragedy that happened two years ago this month in North Buffalo. An eight-year-old boy was killed by his mentally ill mother, Jessica Murphy. Two On Your Side has exclusively obtained the results of a state investigation into Jacob No's death, that harshly criticizes Erie County's Child Protective Services Division for failing to protect the boy. Anyone who knew Jessica Murphy before she started having mental health problems will tell you that she was a great mom to her little boy Jacob. There were trips to Disney, days at the beach, and sledding in the park. Jessica was a single mom. She and Jacob's dad had never married, but they had a cordial relationship. Jessica and Jacob, who was eight years old, lived in a North Buffalo double with Jessica's mother. Starting in late 2012, Jessica began having mental health issues. The pretty, artistic woman became withdrawn and paranoid she thought people were following her, and she said things that didn't make any sense. Starting in late 2012, Murphy was hospitalized four different times at ECMC for psychiatric problems. The last time took place in March of 2014. It was then, on a cold winter's day, that Jessica took Jacob from their North Buffalo home without shoes or a jacket. Jessica was suffering from delusions at that time that Jacob was in grave danger. She came to a pizzeria on Hurdle when police were called. After assessing the situation, Murphy was taken to ECMC where she was admitted. CPS was called and opened a case. It was then, that a series of catastrophic failures by the county's CPS system began, that would result just over two months later in Jacob's death. By law, any time a child dies when there's an open CPS case, the state must investigate and produce what's called a child fatality report. Two on your side obtained the fatality report in Jacob's death, after filing numerous freedom of information requests with the state. The report details that after opening a case involving Jacob, CPS then did virtually nothing. No follow-up. No interviews. Nothing. The only documentation state investigators could find in the county's files was an initial assessment of the case. According to the state fatality report, the safety assessment documented that the child was in immediate or impending danger of serious harm due to the mother's mental illness and was not safe. Following his mother's hospitalization at ECMC, Jacob went to live with his dad. After spending a week at ECMC Jessica Murphy was released, according to the state report. She was suffering from bipolar mood disorder with matic and psychotic features. After about a month of living with his dad, Jacob was returned to live with his mother and grandmother. All during this time, according to the state report, CPS did no follow-up. According to the fatality report, more than two months after the case was first opened, a supervisor at CPS apparently reviewed the file for the first time and dot 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 noted that the case record lacked documentation and that a contact with the family needed to be made. That was May 13, 2014. Early in the morning of May 14, Jessica Murphy went into Jacob's room and, while he was sleeping, stabbed him to death. According to the police report, Murphy said, I'm saving him, and that she had to kill Jacob to keep him from going to hell. Two on your side contacted Rich Gels, a national expert in child protection issues. To review Jacob's fatality report, Gels is the dean of the School of Social Policy at the University of Pennsylvania. Here's how he describes the county's handling of Jacob's case. It's negligent. It's negligent to the point where it shocks the conscience of anybody that would read this report. No evidence of looking into the background of mother. No appreciation of the mother's mental health issues. Even the report checks off the box that says they made no effort to ensure the safety and well-being of the child, said Gels. Today, Jessica Murphy is in the Rochester Psychiatric Center a secure facility, where she receives therapy and medication. Murphy is in the custody and care of the State Department of Mental Health. A judge found her not responsible for Jacob's death due to her mental illness. In a very unusual move, the Erie County District Attorney's Office, after having its own psychiatrist examine Murphy, did not contest her plea. No cameras are allowed in the facility where Murphy lives, but two on your side was able to arrange a phone interview with her. It's the first time she's spoken publicly about what happened. Scott Brown, can you describe what your mental state was in early 2014? Jessica Murphy, in early 2014, my mind was rapidly going in and out of psychotic, manic episodes, 
and at a loss for any reality to grasp onto. It wasn't until the last couple of months of my illness when I slipped into psychosis, that I was unable to be the mother that I had always been. Murphy told Scott Brown she had been suffering from delusions for a while, and that in the months before Jacob's death, the delusions started to focus on Jacob. Jessica Murphy, at the time, I was imagining every possible torture that could be inflicted upon my son and he is the person that I loved more than anybody in the world. I just couldn't let that happen to him, and in my mind I felt the only way to save him from it was to take his life. Scott Brown, do you believe the county bears some responsibility for Jacob's death? Jessica Murphy, everything failed. Nobody decided to put me into long-term care where I needed to be. CPS failed to do their job and the illness came on so quickly that my family was unprepared. Scott Brown, for people watching this, who maybe won't be able to accept that you were found not responsible for Jacob's death, what do you want to say to those people? Jessica Murphy, I think they must be unaware of how tragic and damaging these diseases can be. And also, for what other reason than madness would a loving mother be moved to do what I had done? Following Jacob's death, the CPS worker who had his case was fired by the county. It's believed the supervisor in the case is still employed. Why they did nothing boggles the mind, said Gels. Murphy said she agreed to speak with two on your side in the hope of shedding light on mental illness and preventing similar tragedies in the future. Murphy will remain in the custody of the state until such a time, when she's found no longer to be a danger to herself or others. Last summer, Jacob's father sued Erie County and ECMC for Jacob's death, citing the lawsuit. The county and ECMC declined Scott Brown's request to answer questions about the circumstances surrounding Jacob's death. 6. Baby Russell Months before the baby came into the world, his parents decided he wouldn't live. Sarah Marie Russell and her common-law husband, Rodney Miller, who lived in Moore's Mills, and B, denied the pregnancy when questioned by suspicious social workers. One son had already been taken away after nearly dying from suspected shaken baby syndrome but no one was ever convicted for the damage that was inflicted. The couple never visited a doctor before Sarah Marie gave birth again. Their internet history showed they researched home deliveries. For want of a proper given name, the child became known after his death as Baby Russell. Miller, throughout his interview with police, called him the damn thing. Baby Russell was born on January 17, 2009, inside a small cabin where his parents lived. It appears, a judge said later, that his mother, never held him. She and Miller hoped he would die naturally or be stillborn. When Miller saw his son's tiny fingers move, he selected a knife from the kitchen drawer. Russell was in the bathroom, when Miller placed his hand over his son's chest and felt his heart beat. Then he did the unthinkable. He plunged a knife into the newborn's heart and felt him go limp. Baby Russell had lived for only a few minutes. The body was wrapped in a teddy bear blanket and placed in a garbage bag. Miller cleaned up the house, carefully washing the knife. He hid his son's body under a nearby building. Then he went back inside, drank a few beers, smoked a joint and thought about what to do next. The next day, Russell followed Miller outside, walking past the railway tracks and into the woods, carrying their son's body. He doused baby Russell with gasoline and lit him on fire. Later, he spread snow over the remains. A snowstorm was coming, and Miller hoped the body would stay undetected for months. Social workers noticed Russell's baby bump the summer of 2008. Because of the family's history with social services, a child would likely be seized at birth. Social workers' hands were tied, however. Even as Russell's pregnancy became more apparent, the couple denied it. At Miller's trial, one social worker said she and her colleagues in child protection did not have the legal power to force Russell to take a pregnancy test. They asked hospitals in New Brunswick and Maine to be on the lookout for her, but the mother never went to a doctor. Russell missed some appointments with social workers before giving birth. When she resurfaced, a social worker noticed she was no longer pregnant. A few days later, Police dogs scoured the woods behind the couple's home and found the body. His parents were arrested on suspicion of concealing the baby's death. Their first court appearance drew a crowd at the street. Stephen Courthouse, murderers, baby killers. A man yelled as Russell and Miller were led into court in custody. We lost our baby in January, right after Christmas. The man told a CBC reporter through tears. And you got people like this having children. After his arrest, police interrogated Miller for four hours. He told them the haunting details of his son's birth and death. He eventually changed his plea to guilty of first-degree murder and was sentenced to life in prison, without parole eligibility for 25 years. Russell pleaded guilty to criminal negligence causing death. In sentencing her to 30 months in prison, Judge David Walker said Russell was likely manipulated by her boyfriend. While the mother didn't deliver the fatal blow, she never tried to get help, even following Miller into the woods when he lit their son's body on fire. That she did nothing to protect or nurture her baby, the judge said is heart-wrenching. What happened to the baby is beyond comprehension, and was compounded by the hiding and burning of his body, Walker wrote. Miss Russell was aware of all of that and did nothing, 
absolutely nothing. When defense lawyer Joe Johansson looked at police photographs, he was shocked to see an infant with blue eyes staring back at him. The deep snow had preserved baby Russell's body. He just looked like an innocent, beautiful baby doll, you know, just perfect, Hansen said in a recent interview. The veteran street, Stephen Lawyer was hired to defend Miller at his first degree murder trial. No one in the community could understand why Hansen agreed. There was a lot Hansen didn't understand either. He thinks of his own children and how he felt when they were born. For some reason, Russell and Miller didn't feel that same attachment when their baby came into the world. The parents were determined not to let the boy live. But why? Eight years later, Hansen still doesn't have the answers he wanted. In all their conversations, he could never get an explanation or a motive from Miller. Hansen tries not to think about the case, but it seeps into his mind. No matter how much you try, certain things will trigger it, he said. You'll just never forget. You almost feel obliged, for the baby, not to forget. Baby Russell doesn't have a memorial. There is no grave. No place to leave flowers, no one to celebrate the anniversary of his birth or death. The home has been torn to the ground, reduced to rubble. Back in the woods, behind the train tracks, a single piece of yellow tape remains tied to a tree, a reminder of how he lived and died. Baby Russell would be eight years old now. 7. Jeffrey Baldwin One of the last people who saw Jeffrey Baldwin alive said the five-year-old was so weak and malnourished that as he crawled upstairs to his cold, fetid bedroom in a slow death march, his pajama bottoms fell down with each step. By the time he starved to death Jeffrey weighed 21 pounds, one pound less than he did on his first birthday. It's a disturbing scene that will always stick with retired Toronto police did. Michael Davis, who investigated Jeffrey's death 11 years ago, he was trying to make his way up the stairs, crawling up the stairs as his little pajamas were falling off of the hips because he had no hips. Davis recalled from testimony at the trial where Jeffrey's grandparents were convicted of second-degree murder. You deal with it. But you don't forget it. That's what makes you angry. When you see something like this. What makes me even angrier is the fact that it could have been prevented. Elva Botna and Norman Kidman were already convicted child abusers. When they were granted custody of Jeffrey and three other grandchildren in 2002. But the Catholic Children's Aid Society of Toronto did not find those records until after Jeffrey's death. Botna had a grade 8 education. An IQ of 69 and even by her lawyer's assessment was wholly unqualified to raise children. Major changes have been implemented at the Kazan Children's Aid Societies across Ontario since then, including increased family history, background and record checks. Relatives who become caregivers are also subjected to the same rigorous standards as foster parents and adoptive parents. Child protection policies and practices are expected to be examined, as part of the coroner's inquest into Jeffrey's death, which is set to start Monday. Bodna and Kidman were convicted in 2006, and sentenced to life in prison with no parole for 22 and 20 years, respectively. Botna tried unsuccessfully to appeal her conviction up to the Supreme Court of Canada, and with the High Court refusing last year to hear the appeal, the coroner's inquest could move forward. Jeffrey died weeks shy of his sixth birthday, of septic shock from malnutrition and bacterial pneumonia that was caused by sleeping in his own waste. A pediatric pathologist told Jeffrey's grandparents' trial that the boy developed pneumonia a few days before his death. Fecal bacteria got into his bloodstream, causing septic shock that would have made it difficult to breathe. Experts at the trial likened Jeffrey's body to that of a starving child in a third world country. He was just emaciated, said Davis, who is now a private investigator. His ribs were exposed. I mean, just the overall appearance of him was horrific. I don't know what to think of those that may have seen that and just turned a blind eye. Six adults and six children under 10 years old were living in the East End Toronto home when Jeffrey died. Botna and Kidman, their daughter Timmy, her husband and their two children, another daughter, Yvette, her boyfriend James Mills, and Jeffrey and his three siblings, the children of the couple's other daughter, Yvonne, who lost custody of them. Mills testified, reluctantly, at Botana and Kidman's trial and painted a grim picture of Jeffrey's life, and the blatant abuse that no one reported, for reasons that Davis still struggles to understand. Jeffrey and one of his sisters were treated worse than dogs while the other children were apparently well looked after. Jeffrey and his sister were confined for up to 14 hours a day to their unheated bedroom, which was soaked with urine, stained with feces and littered with bags of filthy diapers throughout, with no toys in sight, while the rest of the house was spotless. The two children were called pigs, and were forced to sit on a shoe mat in the pig's corner, and eat leftover scraps from bowls with their hands. Court heard from a statement from Jeffrey's other sister. It would have been clear to anyone who saw Jeffrey that he was in desperate need of help. The trial heard, months before Mills watched Jeffrey crawling up the stairs while his pajama pants fell down, he saw the little boy spend more than 10 minutes struggling to go up the stairs to bed, he told police. Mills said in a statement to police that he thought Jeffrey looked sickly from the first day he saw the boy, months earlier. It was almost like a death march, Mills said. He was waiting to die. Mills, 
who enjoyed free meals and board while living in the house with his girlfriend, admitted at trial that he didn't want to jeopardize his easy lifestyle by fighting for the emaciated boy's welfare. Davis said people asked him at the time why every adult in that house wasn't charged. Bodna and Kidman were charged with murder as well as forcible confinement for the treatment of Jeffrey's sister. Beyond that, Davis said he was bound by the Child and Family Services Act. Under that law, everyone has a duty to report suspected child abuse, but the only people who could be found guilty of an offense for not reporting it are professionals working with children such as doctors and teachers. A Crown lawyer told Bodna and Kidman's trial that the couple routinely lied about Jeffrey's condition to doctors and emergency workers to cover their tracks. Kidman told police that Jeffrey wasn't sent to school because he wasn't toilet trained and wouldn't have been accepted. Bodna and Kidman used the children as a source of income, collecting government support checks in their names. The trial was told. Jeffrey's siblings were taken into care after he died. The oldest sister would be about 19 years old now and Davis hopes they are faring all right. I've thought of it many times, wondered about them, and how they're doing and how they're coping with it, he said. The eldest one was showing a lot of guilt. I've always wondered about her and about Jeffrey's other sister. There's no doubt in my mind that she could have been a second victim. 8. Serenity, her life and her death, though, were anything but serene. Alberta's child and youth advocate, Del Graff issued a review of the case of a four-year-old Fierce Nations girl who died, while in a kinship care placement. The report gave her a pseudonym, Marie. Graf's review revealed that the relatives with whom the girl had been placed had been poorly trained, and that the home study of their family had been cursory. The review also found Serenity and her two older half-siblings had been left in the guardianship of this couple, despite complaints and tips about abuse. No workers had checked on the three children in the 11 months before Serenity died. Graf's report was disturbing enough but it omitted medical details even more shocking. Based on medical records obtained by the journal, Serenity arrived at a hospital in central Alberta on September 18, 2014, suffering from a suspected head injury, with blown or dilated pupils. She was four years and three months old. She weighed just 18 pounds, the weight of a typical nine-month-old baby. Notes from the emergency room describe multiple bruises all over her body, some green in color and others purple. The notes describe bruising to the child's pubic area. Her hymen was gone. When she arrived at the hospital, Serenity was also suffering from severe hypothermia, with a rectal temperature of 30.1 C. Normal for a child is 37 to 38 C. Serenity had not been brought to the hospital by ambulance. She had been driven there by an older woman who identified herself as Serenity's grandmother. She was actually Serenity's relative by a marriage, who, along with her husband, had been awarded guardianship of Serenity and her two siblings. The woman said Serenity had fallen from a tire's wing. But her staff found the woman's explanation vague, her manner peculiar, family emotionless. Read the notes. Zero crying, zero emotion. Serenity was airlifted to the Stollery Children's Hospital in Edmonton. Doctors determined she had suffered a severe and horrific brain injury, with no hope of recovery. In addition to bruising on her chest and back, she had genital bruising and unusual bruising around her anus. A forensic pediatrician determined her injuries were inconsistent with a fall. Serenity remained on life support long enough for her birth parents to say goodbye to her. She died on September 27, 2014. Court documents say Serenity's siblings, then five and six, told Zebra Child Protection interviewers they had been abused by two adults living in the home. More than two years later, Alberta's medical examiner has not released Serenity's cause of death. The child and youth advocate, an independent officer of the legislature, was denied a copy of an autopsy report. The case has never been ruled a homicide. Corporal Laurel Scott, who speaks for the RCMP in central Alberta, says an investigation is still open. Because of that, she offered no further comment. Why did the child advocate's report omit any reference to the genital and anal bruising, and the absent hymen, which might suggest sexual assault, or to the hypothermia? Tim Chander, who speaks for the advocate's office, says it doesn't include such details unless they're confirmed by the medical examiner. So in the absence of the medical examiner's report, that vital information was excluded from Graf's review. And why, after more than two years, has the medical examiner provided no information? On Friday, Alberta Justice could provide me no answers. I can't name Serenity's mom. Alberta's child welfare legislation forbids me to publish anything that could identify Serenity's surviving siblings. I can tell you that her mom is 28. She moved east of the province. She has regained custody of her children, trained as a chef, is engaged to be married. She says she has been clean and sober for five years. I did a whole 360 on my life, she says. I was 20 when I met Serenity's father. It seemed things were good at first, but then a turn for the worse. He was heavily into partying and I was starting to realize that he fought with me a lot because he liked to. He assaulted me and I called police, and then child welfare got involved. The domestic violence and her substance abuse, she drank alcohol and used marijuana, but insists she took no harder drugs, 
resulted in the apprehension of her children. Serenity, she says, thrived in foster care. Her first foster home was really great. She was super healthy there and I got to spend a lot of time with her. But then, she says, she was told her children would be adopted out, separately and permanently, unless she agreed to have them placed with family members in a kinship care arrangement. Feeling she had no choice, she agreed to have the children placed with a couple who were related to her father. I knew them pretty good, she says. I thought I did. Anyways, it turns out I didn't know them at all. After her children had been living in kinship care for a few months, she says they were losing weight. Her son appeared to have scabies, she complained. She took pictures and videos. All that happened, she says, was that child welfare workers and her relatives banned her from seeing the children. Other relatives tried to see the children and bring them gifts, but were turned away. Her photos of serenity show a smiling, chubby-cheeked baby and a solid, playful toddler with a wide, wild grin. But a cousin, who had a brief visit with the children seven months before Serenity's death, took photos of a very different child with skeleton thin arms, gaunt wrists, a cut, bruised face and haunting, sad eyes that had lost their light and mischief. A year before her death, Serenity was at the 50th percentile for size, absolutely average. Twelve months later, her weight was so low, it's simply not on the chart for a four-year-old girl. How was this allowed to happen? How was it that children's services simply gave guardianship of three children to this couple despite the allegations of abuse? then never checked up on them. How did a child starve in a province of plenty? Why, despite the horrifying medical evidence, has no one been charged with anything? Serenity's mother is still grieving, still angry her efforts at the time to get her children out of kinship care failed. I'm not a horrible person nor a bad mother, she says. I've always tried my best and I still am. I did everything I was told to by child welfare, but nothing was ever good enough. My kids in Serenity definitely deserve justice. 9. Jackie Brewer, Sherry Bordage knocked on the door of her estranged brother's home and waited. For months, she'd heard rumors that her younger brother was a drug addict, that he and his common-law wife weren't feeding their three young children. In the summer of 1996, Bordage, then living in Ontario, returned to her hometown on vacation to find out for herself. She drove to the bottom of Canterbury Street in St. John's South End and found the shabby, brick apartment building where her brother, Mark James, and his partner, Helen Brewer, lived. Bordage's husband and two young children followed her inside. Immediately, Bordage was hit with the smell of urine and garbage. The lights were off in the apartment. It was supper time, but no one was preparing food. In the living room, Bordage saw two children, both pale and thin. Ten-month-old Ryan sat in a bassinet in the corner. Sonia, four, was curious about the new guests and invited her older cousin to play in her bedroom. The girl slept on a mattress on the floor, covered by a thin sheet. When Bordage asked to see Jackie, the middle child, James went to the back of the apartment and returned with a girl who was dirty, disheveled and wearing only a diaper. Later, Bordage would find out her niece was kept in her crib all day and night. No one to talk to her, no one to hold her, no one to love her. Jackie was 28 months old but hadn't learned to walk or talk. She screamed and struggled against her father, and he took her back to her crib before Bordage could hold her. I couldn't handle it anymore. She recalled in a recent interview from her home in Arizona, I packed up and got out of there as quickly as I could. Bordage called social services. The next day she followed up in person. She told social workers she was worried for the children's safety. She feared for Jackie's life. My main concern was to get all of the children out of the home immediately, before something terrible happened. Bordage had a good job, a big house and a family of her own. She offered to take custody of her nieces and nephew. Social workers promised to look into her concerns, but the children remained in the home. Bordage went back to Ontario. A few months later, at about noon on December 17, 1996, Jackie died. It took more than nine hours before anyone noticed, long enough for the family's pet chinchilla to start chewing on her body. The cause of death was dehydration. Jackie hadn't had anything to drink for about six days. Doctors said, how? People in St. John asked, could a child die in plain sight, in the middle of a city? Under the supervision of social workers, Bordage wouldn't learn of her niece's death until a sister spotted a newspaper story. It didn't have any names, but the ages of the children matched up. Police confirmed Bordage's fears. When she tried to figure out why her concerns had gone unaddressed, she was stonewalled. Later, she found out social services received 16 complaints about her brother's family over three years. The children were even taken away once, only to be sent back. Bordage hired a lawyer and began a lengthy court battle to get custody of Jackie's brother and sister. Her mind flipped between horror at what her niece suffered and a profound sadness and loss. That's the one thing I kept thinking throughout the whole course of this, she said. At any point, they could have stepped in and saved these children, 
that Jackie's life could have been saved. Mark James and Helen Brewer were convicted of manslaughter and were each sentenced to three years and nine months in prison. Justice Hugh McClellan delivered the sentence on December 17, 1997, exactly one year after Jackie died. In an unusual move, he ordered a public memorial to Jackie and suggested an inscription, aged 28 months, died in St. John on December 17, 1996, neglected, dehydrated and forgotten in her crib at home, where she lived in loneliness, squalor and misery with her parents, under the supervision of social workers, healthcare experts and child protection officials. Her death diminishes all of us. We will remember Jacqueline. James and Brewer weren't guilty of losing their tempers, the judge wrote or of shaking Jackie until she stopped crying. They did not murder Jacqueline. They ignored her to death. Outside the courthouse that day, an angry crowd gathered. Child murderer, a woman yelled at Brewer, I hope you rot in hell. The anger spread to the legislature in Fredericton, where politicians vowed to make changes to prevent another tragedy. They promised more emphasis on getting children out of unsafe homes. They promised more social workers, more training in detecting neglect. They also created a child death review committee, whose job would be to analyze the deaths of children who had been in care, or who had received social services. For a while, the spotlight was on Jackie, and then it faded. A short walk from the brick building where Jackie died there is a playground called Rainbow Park. It was built in memory of Jackie and John Ryan Turner, a three-year-old who was beaten and starved to death by his parents in 1994. The plaque that once commemorated the two children is gone. No one ever built the memorial the judge suggested. Brewer and James completed their sentences long ago. Tracked down at the Fredericton Courthouse earlier this year, James refused to talk about Jackie. When Bordage thinks about her brother's crime, she thinks back to their own childhood. Both siblings were abused and shuttled between homes. Bordage ran away at 14. Her brother stayed behind. She broke the cycle. He didn't. Bordage would win custody of her niece Sonia and nephew Ryan. After racking up a $12,000 legal bill, the provincial government quietly paid the tab. On their first Christmas with Bordage and her family, the two children woke up to a giant little tyke slide in the living room and presents from Santa. They got to experience Christmas and birthdays. After a while, they were privately adopted into a new family together. Their aunt wanted to protect them from their own family. I wanted the adoption to be closed so that no one in the family would have access to the children ever, Bordage said. As they became adults, Bordage mailed them court clippings and transcripts from their parents' trial, so they would know the truth. Because, Jackie, died, Sonia and Ryan were removed from that home, Bordage said. Because she died, they were adopted and have had happy lives. They, too, have broken the cycle. Bordage spends winters in Arizona, 5,000 kilometers from where Jackie died, but her niece is always on her mind. She thinks of her every time she sees a girl with black curly hair, just like her brother Mark's. Bordage has abandoned the anger she felt about her niece's death and instead focuses on change, more transparency, less secrecy. She wants the provincial government to reveal more details about the deaths of vulnerable children, and what could have been done to prevent them. Let's make sure that no more children get lost. Let's prevent more deaths because as sad as it is, we can't undo what's been done. 10. Sean and Delilah Tara As the social worker interviewed Sean and Delilah Tara and their older half-sister in their dirty, cluttered apartment in this Central Valley town, Cockroaches scurried across their bedroom walls. On this August 27th visit, the social worker with Monterey County Child Protective Services who started tracking the children and their guardian Tammy Huntsman in April, made several observations. Bruises and scratches on six-year-old Sean's forehead. The nine-year-old sister shaved head caused by repeated lice treatments burning off her hair. The kids bloodied legs from scratching their many flea bites. When the social worker asked Huntsman, 39, about the report her office received that Delilah, 3, was being tied to the bed as punishment. She denied it. The kids told her they felt safe, and she left the apartment. She was the last social worker to see Sean and Delilah alive. On December 11th, Plumas County officials found their nine-year-old sister lying in a car with broken fingers, shoulder bones, a dislocated jaw, and missing teeth, infested with lice and weighing only 40 pounds. Two days later, Sean and Delilah were found dead in barrels kept in Huntsman's storage locker in Reading their horrific fate a national story. Huntsman and her 17-year-old boyfriend, Gonzalo Curiel, have since been charged with murder, torture and great bodily harm and are awaiting trial in Monterey County. Questions have been raised about failures of social workers to follow state regulations, and best practices in monitoring the three siblings' deteriorating home life, but the 135 pages of CPS documents obtained by this newspaper, also paint a tragic tale of young kids passed from one troubled family to another forced to endure squalid living conditions and a chaotic existence. Nobody else wanted to take us. The Terra Trio, the oldest surviving girl's name was redacted in records, 
grew up in Riverside and San Bernardino counties, social workers there made numerous visits to their home to investigate reports of neglect and abuse while under the care of their biological parents, according to records. In 2013, their mother committed suicide by jumping in front of a car, Huntsman told investigators. Months later, their father, the biological dad of the two youngest and stepfather of the oldest, was sentenced to prison on drug charges. Before his incarceration, he asked Huntsman, his cousin, to care for the kids so they wouldn't tender the system, Huntsman told social workers. When one social worker asked the older daughter how they came to Huntsman's care, the girl told her, nobody else wanted to take us, so she took and adopted us. In fact, Huntsman never adopted the children and had no legal guardianship. California law allows for such informal transfer of custodial rights to avoid the cost for families and overcrowded courts, said Bill Grimm senior attorney for Oakland-based National Center for Youth Law. According to the census, about 5% of children live in a house with neither parent. Over the past year, Monterey County social workers continually asked Huntsman to go to probate court to get legal guardianship of the siblings, but she never did. The children first landed on Monterey County social workers' radar in April and May while investigating Huntsman for neglect. Someone had reported the kids home alone, and their school said the older girl wore the same sweater and ripped pants every day looked unkempt, had lice and appeared frequently hungry, eating large amounts of food at lunch. She had 16 unexcused absences that year. School staff mentioned that Huntsman's biological 12-year-old twins appeared in better shape. The report found that 11 people lived in the tiny, cluttered apartment. During a visit, Sean, a shy but polite boy, told the social worker that a teenage boy in the home sometimes spanked him and his sister with belt. Huntsman told the social worker she did not know about the belt and it would not be tolerated and attributed the truancy issues to a stalking issue with her ex-husband who had substance abuse problems, according to CPS notes. Huntsman said the teen, whose name was redacted, was a kid from the neighborhood who was friends with her son, and she was helping take care of him. CPS concluded the allegations were inconclusive and said there was no imminent safety threat. Without immediate danger, any change in custody would need to be decided in court, the investigator wrote. While it is difficult, she wants to keep the children in her care because she made a promise to their father and also because they are like her family now," she wrote. On May 19, Monterey County social workers received a call that the children's grandparents had been searching for Sean, Delala and their sister since their mother died. Huntsman told social workers the grandparents were not fit to care for the children, and neither Huntsman nor the grandparents filled out paperwork to formally request legal guardianship. Social workers noted, by August, CPS responded to another report, this time that all three kids were neglected, and that Delala was tied to the bed when she would wet herself among other allegations. During the August 27th visit the same social worker noticed bruises and scratches on Sean's forehead and that he had lost weight. The boy, first looking at his older sister before answering each question, said he slept on a toy and the kitten scratched him. Grimm said it is difficult for social workers to get honest answers from children, especially when they are under duress. They lost the two most important people in their lives, and now they've found some stability again, he said. And my guess is they're being told. If you don't stay here you'll end up in foster care or worse. In her private interview with the kids, the social worker noted Huntsman remained with an earshot in the tiny apartment, which had no bedroom doors. Should this family come to the attention of the department again, it is highly recommended the children be interviewed privately, she wrote. That would never happen. For a month, social workers left three voicemails, knocked on the door three times, wrote a letter and checked if the family's address had changed on a benefits database, with no luck finding them. On September 29th, the same social worker who had visited the home and made the observations concluded the original referral was inconclusive, closed the case and wrote it was unknown if there was imminent safety threats, because the assessment couldn't be completed. CPS social workers never indicated whether any neighbors or family were contacted asking their family's whereabouts, even though Huntsman had relatives next door. With the family still missing, on October 16 Monterey County CPS received a call from the kids' elementary school on the department's abuse hotline. The caller told a different social worker that the lice situation with the older sister continued, and that the girl told school staff she watches the kids alone at night while the adults leave. The girl also said Huntsman may have a relationship with a teenage boy and that the younger kids are being zip-tied to the bed as punishment. A call log indicates CPS asked Selena's police to conduct a health and welfare check at the house that night. The officers knocked and no one answered. The social worker noted that the allegations were previously reported and investigated, and no further investigation was conducted. According to records, state officials determined this violated regulations. Sean and Delilah were killed about a month later, according to state death reports. Neighbors said they saw Huntsman and q moving out of the apartment around Thanksgiving, and law enforcement have said the children were not killed in the county they were found. The surviving children have been taken into protective custody.